Hello, and before we start today's video, I just want to give you guys a quick reminder about the big giveaway at the end of the year 2021, where I'm going to be giving away a bunch of stuff that has been featured here on the channel, big, small, and somewhere in between. In order to enter, all you've got to do is, during the course of this video, I will mention a Christmas movie. I'll try and subtly weave it into this dialogue, and hopefully you guys will spot it. Don't get me wrong, I know a lot of you are just going to go through the comments, find it, and go, well, I'm going to copy and paste what he put. For the record, a lot of you seem to be getting them wrong in the other videos, so maybe double check before you go ahead and do that. But once again, if you do want to enter for the giveaway at the end of the year, all you got to do during the course of this video, I mentioned a Christmas movie at some point. All you got to do is run that in the comments of this video, or if this video is being shared on a NAS Compares channel, like the Facebook or the blog or something like that, stick it in the comments underneath that. I will be able to see it. Nowhere else will count. Just those one entry per person, and without that, without, you know, with that out of the way, let's crack on with the video. That is right. Today we are looking at the brand new Synology DS3622XS. I think it's the third or fourth time we've talked about it on the channel thus far. And although we kind of have all agreed, we've all sat down and gone, do you know what? This is one of the best bloody NASes that Synology have put out there. We've got to at least accept that its architecture bears striking similarity to its predecessor, the DS3617XS. Two, which had a two on the end, we'll cover that at one point. Now, big NASes like that old one or this one, the 3622XS Plus, are insane. They are unquestionably the best out there. And to have one of these in your office, have one of them in your home doing all your stuff, well, it's a wonderful life, let's be honest. But it's not perfect. There are things about it that may not be right for you. You know, its size, its scale, its power, its sheer storage volume may be way, way, way outside of the spectrum of your needs. And if you are looking at the best desktop solution from Synology, you may already have a budget in mind of what to spend. So in today's video, we're going to go through the main key differences between this, the 3622XS Plus, and its predecessor, which is hopefully sort of going to be on screen. But given the size of this, I'm not going to do my usual side-by-side -side graphic stuff, the 3621. Seven XS2. These two NASes, although very, very similar, have very important differences between them. And one of the earliest important differences, let's crack on early doors, is that price. Normally, in Synology's architecture of releases in their portfolio, when they refresh a new series with a new follow up version, be it desktop or rack mount, you generally find that the price remains roughly the same. You know, adjusted for inflation, adjusted for market trends, that sort of thing. A two bay with an Intel Celeron processor, two gig of memory, and one GB on the rear is going to be roughly the same sort of price all the way through the family lines, with an increase somewhere of around three to five percent each generation of two to three years. In the case of this device, however, its predecessor came out in two, in the 2017 or 16 17 window for them. And it arrived and is currently available for around $2,499. Let's call it two and a half to be on the safe side. Now that price does fluctuate, that's unpopulated. Um, and when it originally arrived, it was a little bit more expensive than that. And now the new units out there it has to be said that the older generation unit now is seeing somewhat of a price renaissance there, arriving in some places as low as $2,300, that sort of thing. And that price is obviously, as the new one remains in the public kind of visibility, the old one, eventually that price is going to start dipping down a little lower and lower. So what is that price difference? The new unit, the 3622, is arriving at $2,999 in most shops. And again, this isn't just Amazon, this is your B&Hs. This is down to your Ebays if need be. A lot of your on-time re retailers have kind of got that static pricing. It's quite new. There's not a lot of flexibility of pricing. So that's quite a lot of money given that its old unit is $500 cheaper, at least on the high sticker RRP. And once you look around, you can actually get that difference to be about six, close to $700 between them. So as we go through this comparison, you got to factor in that as we can, as we look at all the things that are on this unit that aren't on the previous unit, that's kind of where your money's going. Even if you were to not tap in for that slight inflation, price difference, tech, etc., it's a big old jump. So... Let's talk about one of the um, internal big differences between them. And this is an area of slight contention. It's to do with the CPU. 
This system, uh, both its predecessor and the newer unit, arrived with an Intel Xeon. Uh, it's an Intel Xeon inside the Xeon D series there, and the old unit factored in a quad-core uh, D1527. That um, Xeon processor there had 2.2 gigahertz clock speed per core. It was a four-core CPU, and each of those cores could be burst up to 2.7. Doesn't feature in embedded graphics. It's great uh, background caching on that chip and handling. Fantastic file handling structure there from one gig, uh, one gig connectivity 10 as well. Um, so all of uh, that connectivity there is a high, high quality level and handling of files as well as the handling of DSM itself being particularly good on the DS17 um, uh, XS2. Now, the DS3622XS, on the other hand, it has a better CPU but whether you would call it an upgraded CPU is a matter for debate. It has the same family CPU as Xeon D1531. It is 2.2 gigahertz. It can be burst up to 2.7. But this is a six-core processor, so two extra cores. It also has slight tweaks and improvements in the cache handling. Um, but, you know, that's not an enormous jump. They're both from the same family line. Both of these CPUs arrived in you know the last quarter of 2015 they're server grade they're great server grade cpus that are still in circulation and synology have clearly done a lot of r d on this chip to get the very best out of it for dsm and handling you can't you know there's no questioning that but still there's not an enormous difference there so i don't think that cpu makes up the lion's share of the price difference there i think it's you know a decent little chunk but not all of it another big difference between this device and that of the older device before it, I know you might like blink and you miss it, is the memory. They both arrive with 16 gig of DDR4 memory that can be upgraded up to a weird 48 gig because of the placement of some of the slots being near enough impossible to get to without dismantling this thing completely. The new unit arrives with ECC memory, error code correction or error correcting code memory. This has creates an extra checksum during all data being passed through it that it compares against and therefore, it file it heals data as it passes through it if any kind of corruption takes place while being managed and handled by the memory and the cache. So, again, that is a small, small distinction, but something that Synology has been rolling out on a lot of their devices, and I think it's a bigger deal than it gets a lot more credit for in a lot of places when people compare the old and new generation units in the most re recent 12 month re 12 month refresh of a lot of those series of devices. Now. I'm sure a number of you have already thought this, but it's worth detailing for everyone else. Uh, probably one of the biggest differences between this and the older unit is 10 gigabit. This device has two 10G ports on the rear, both copper based, um, 10G base T there. This device arrives with an additional potential 2000 megabytes per second external connectivity, two gigabytes connectivity there. And again, the old unit had four 1GBE ports. This has got two 10s, two 1s, and a management port, an out-of-band management port there that can be used as an additional line-in for troubleshooting. So extra little differences like that are genuinely appreciated by a lot of people that liked the old unit. But even when it was released in the 2017 year, a lot of people were kind of, where's the 10G? And Synology always kind of held 10 gigabit Ethernet at arm's length. They had... 10 GB NAS is out there, but the pre until 2020, the majority of their 10 GB offerings were either super enterprise anyway, and it was an expectation at that level, or they arrived with an element of, uh, let's just say, compromise in the CPUs, with some of them arriving with fairly low-grade CPUs, although you had 10 gigabit Ethernet connectivity externally, you'd have to get some pretty good media to max those out with a processor that's kind of... <laughs> so, again... With that CPU and this 10 GBE, those are the big things that make up that price difference between them. And this device, in every other regard, has got the same USB connectivity, it's got the same expandability as the newer device, device um, unit, it's got the same PCIe Gen 3 times 8 slot there. And of course, in the time that's passed between the release of these two units, Synology have hammered it, hammered it, hammered it. Uh, the PCIe upgrade cards that they have released, they've released now they've you know dipped more on a toe into 10 gbe with lots of 10 gigabit ethernet cards in single and dual port then you've got fiber channel cards up to 25 gig dual port cards then you've got your caching cards your upgrade cards that allow you to add nvme ssd upgrade slots onto this 
something a lot of people kind of assumed would be built in anyway, but okay. Um, then you've got combo cards like the ones behind me that allow you to have both 10 GPE and M2 SSD caching inside. Then Synology released their own NVMEs. Then Synology released their own hard drives. Then Synology released their own this, that, and the other. And again, Synology have changed a lot as a company since the release of the predecessor. Now, one of those things is a reason that you might not go for the new unit. Because I think it's very, I'm, I'm going to if I'm going to put my yes minister hat on here and say it's a very courageous decision uh, by Synology here with their support of hard drive and SSD media on these devices. For those that aren't aware, these devices now from Synology that enter into the business or enterprise level bracket, they are all seemingly now arriving with a much more streamlined um, compatibility. So what that means is, get that drive out of there. Is that the wrong drive? Did I put them in the box? Yeah, I was doing the other drive. Um, they have stated that these solutions are only comp um, compatible with and supporting Synology's own hard drive media range. Currently at the time of recording, available in 8, 12 and 16 um, terabyte capacities. Do not be surprised if they launch an 18 TB very, very soon because Toshiba just released their MG9s. Um, but a lot of users are having their feathers slightly ruffled by the idea of having such limited compatibility. Now bear in mind, yes, you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm just going to ignore them. I'm going to stick in my own drives. If you do non-Synology drives inside this, or at least drives that are not on the compatibility list, because there's a few exceptions, what will happen is, once you log into DSM-7, which is a default on this, you can't go 6.2, it will stop you from moving those drives into a storage pool. You're not able to drag them over because they're not on their compatibility list. Synology have stated they're not going to support people using unsupported configurations. Now, a lot of that is because they have tailored and geared their systems with in-house development, which, you know, can be good for the industry. A lot of people would also hear that and say, no, nah, it sounds like you're trying to flog your own wares. And again, it's a hell of a tightrope to be like dabbling with there. So if you are not in love with the idea of having drives that are locked to a certain brand, or in this case, to the very first party brand, fair play to them. They are good drives. I've vouched for that in the past. I'm just not sure how I feel about the idea of the kind of limited choice. Um, if you're not in love with that, the older generation unit does not have um, that kind of l smaller supported capacity uh, of drives. By capacity, I mean range, of course. Um, with that, you can use WDs, you can use Seagates, you can use Toshibas, you can use their own drives, and their own drives are good. You know, firmware updates out coming out of the wazoo, great performance, a price point, there's an um, you know, enterprise level drive at a pro class price. They are good drives. It's just that restrictive choice thing. And remember, both of these devices arrive with five years of manufacturer's warranty, which is great. You know, that's what I want if I'm an enterprise business user. But it's also worth highlighting that if you buy the old unit right now, if you did, you know, you, you saw the 3617XS2 brand new on sale from a, you know, a real retailer there with, you know, in, invoice receipt, whatever, that five-year warranty is still going to count moving forward, which means if you buy it in 2022, that warranty is going to last till 2027. And again, don't be surprised if three or four years, if something does happen, and again, these are damn reliable devices, but if something does happen that re necessitates replacement, do not be surprised if Synology then go, we haven't got any of the old one, you're going to have to have that brand new one. Yay! Bear in mind, of course, Synology does support the migration of old drives, so that's drives that are non-Synology to be migrated over into the new device. Once you use the migration option, you can use old drives in the system and not um, result in your warranty be unsupported in that way. But you have to use the migration tool in order to do it. It's too restrictive not to. So again, the main differences between these two systems, as, we, as we've outlined, are that CPU, which for me is more of a side grade than an upgrade. It is the memory being ECC, which I do really, really like. It is the inclusion of 10 gigabit Ethernet, massive tick from me, and ultimately a device that can do more. And if you are wrapping your business around DSM, you're not just using it as idle, no face backup storage. This is a great choice now, and it is definitely one of my favorite NASs of 2021, and I do recommend it. So again, Go for this if you want the very best desktop experience from Synology that's available right now. Consider the older generation device. If you want all of that stuff, 
you're not fussed about 10 GBE or are happy to upgrade later via PCIe and you want to use your own drives. But this has been what's the difference between the DS3622XS Plus and the DS3617XS2. I told you I'd say what it was. That too, by the way, at the end, I've made a video about it already. It's simply that they changed the power supplier out for a newer, more efficient model. Simple as that. Nothing more. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe and the bell to be notified. I hate seagulls. We got so close, didn't we? Um, and don't forget about that Christmas um, entry there into the comments for the big giveaway. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.